evening, my name is Scott Rosner. I'm the academic director of the sports management program here at Columbia in the School of Professional Studies. Um, really honored to uh, be working with the bioethics program uh, and with, uh, with Professor Klitzman. Um, and really, you know, a great panel, and I'll turn it over to Bob to, uh, for him to introduce everyone, but really appreciate everyone attending. It's kind of the nice thing about being in the school that we're in. Uh, and sports being so interdisciplinary in nature that we have the ability to work with a number of different uh, of our fellow programs from everything from construction administration, which is a little bit different panel than the <laughs> one we'll be doing tonight, um, to, uh, to non-com, to, to uh, non-profit uh, management, to uh, negotiation and conflict resolution, so on and so forth. Um, so it's really a pleasure and a lot of fun for us to do these things too because we get to see what they actually do in their day job. Um, so I will turn it over to uh, Professor Klitzman to, uh, to make the introductions. Here you go, Bob. Great. I think I'm mic already, so I think we're okay. Um, so thank you, uh, and I just want to thank Scott and his team, Tom, and the other folks uh, who've made this possible. And I should say that we have a large number of people who are online joining us right now. So to people joining us online, welcome. And during the question and answer period, please feel free to ask questions, and we'll be answering your questions as well as those of people here in the audience, and feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, and uh, we're delighted uh, to have a wonderful panel and to have all of you here joining us as well. And I really see this as a very interactive session uh, where I've asked each of the panels to talk for a little bit about their perspectives on the intersections of sports and bioethics. But clearly these are large issues that we all read about, many of us have been involved with in different ways. And so we welcome a chance to talk with you as well. So we're gonna have uh, three panelists speak. First, I'm delighted to have Kathleen Bashinsky with us. She trained here, getting a, um, a doctorate in public health in sociomedical sciences here at Columbia. She then wrote a book called no, no Game for Boys to Play, about the history of youth football and public health implications of that. Uh, we're also, after her, gonna have Jonathan Becker speak. He is a sports medicine physician at University of Louisville, where he is also the sports doctor for several teams, a basketball team and other teams, and has lots of wonderful firsthand experience with many of these issues. And last, but by no means least, we have Barbara Rothschild, who's a physician who trained in ethics and in medicine and teaches our clinical ethics course uh, and, uh, among other things, has had uh, family members who've been on teams and things. So, uh, children. Children. Who <laughs> there play you go. sports. <laughs> so, uh, from a mother's perspective as well. So, without further ado, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming our panelists. See if I can get this on properly. Oops. You could just hold it if you want, I suppose. But. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my work in this area, which is from a public health point of view. So the first point I wanted to make is that public health ethics are a little bit different than clinical or bioethics. Um, clinical ethics are often very much focused on the doctor-patient relationship. Uh, whereas in public health, we tend to look more at the population or community level. So we tend to think more about how does a health issue affect a population as a whole and what kinds of policies or other sorts of approaches do we want to take to address health from a population level. So when I started to get interested in the issue of brain injury as a public health issue, and I started look, looking into specifically brain injuries or concussions in sports, uh, when I started to study football, I actually became much more interested in youth football than in the NFL level. And that's because there are way more kids that play football than adults. So to give you a sense of the numbers, there's about two million or so kids age uh, six to 14, so the elementary or middle school level, who play tackle football. Very often it's not through the elementary or middle school, it's through their sort of Pop Warner or other kind of private league, but that age group represents the majority of football players in the United States. The next biggest group is the high school level. There's about one million high school students, mostly boys, who play tackle football. So all told, we have about three million kids, age 18 or under, playing football. Compare that to the NCAA, the college level, which has about 100,000, and then compare that to the NFL, which is just a couple thousand players. And you can see that kids are by far, something 90-something percent of football players in the United States are children. 
And that's partly because it's mostly through schools or through leagues for kids, and partly because we don't have tackle football leagues for 40 or 50 year olds for a very good reason. It's a really dangerous sport. I don't think any of my public health colleagues would say, as a public health measure, we need to promote more tackle football at older ages. So because we don't have tackle football leagues the way you might have a basketball league or a soccer league for older adults, that's another big reason most of the players are kids. So when I started to look at this as a public health issue, I said, okay, kids are where it's at. They represent the largest segment of football players. They also, I think, are more vulnerable, both in terms of their biology, but also in terms of ethics. And what I mean by that is that kids' brains are still developing, which means they might be more vulnerable to repeated injuries, but also kids have weaker necks. Um, they have various reasons that their, their susceptibility may be greater than that of adults. And then in terms of ethics, kids cannot give informed consent. They're not able to fully understand the potential long-term risks and benefits of playing a full body collision sport. So that means it's an adult decision as to when or if kids should be playing tackle football. So I ended up deciding to do a bunch of research and I ended up needing a book to write it all up because it took me a long time. Um, but I thought I want to understand the history of why did we decide as a culture, as a community, to have tackle football be one of our preeminent sports for kids, to have something that's relatively dangerous, a full body collision sport, be offered through schools and be offered predominantly to children. And I found out that this actually has been very controversial for a very long time. And the reason the book is called No Game for Boys to Play is because all the way back in 1907, the Journal of the American Medical Association, which was one of our most preeminent medical journals, they published an editorial where they took a look at football and they said, this is really dangerous. Teddy Roosevelt tried to make it safer a year or two ago at the college level, and maybe that's helping a bit for the college players, but this is really no game for boys to play. And they wrote that in 1907. Spoiler alert, no one paid attention to the doctors. <laughs> so those doctors got totally ignored. Football took off for kids. More and more boys played football. And then it turned out that in many ways, football overtook baseball, particularly after uh, the 1950s and 60s, in many ways, as our national sport. So I think this raises some really profound and interesting ethical questions about how we think about the risks of a sport that has inherent repeated full body collisions, and how do we think about that for kids? And I'll sort of wrap up by saying, I see two different ethical approaches right now. They're not totally mutually exclusive, but the two sort of trends I see right now when we're thinking about youth tackle football are either do we take a harm reduction approach or do we try to shift the culture? So the idea of a harm reduction approach would be, okay, football is super popular. We're not ready to try to get rid of it. We don't think it's feasible to get rid of it. Is there a way we can minimize the harm? And the effort there has often been, for example, to try to tweak the design of a football helmet or to try to change the tackling technique or otherwise um, try to address uh, the particular mechanisms of how the sport is played without fundamentally changing its nature as a tackle sport. The other approach, which full disclosure is the one I support, um, is to try to shift the culture away from collision sports for kids and to say, you know what, let's have an alternative such as flag football or lower contact sports for younger kids the argument for that approach is that it actually doesn't seem like we can do a very good job of minimizing the harm. Um, there isn't a helmet or a tackling technique that I know of that can really make repeated collisions safe for human brains. We just have not found a way to engineer around the vulnerability of the human brain to repeated impacts. So the argument for shifting the culture is that actually harm reduction doesn't seem to work all that well. So I think those are sort of the two basic approaches and I'll certainly be interested to talk more about which way or which direction this conversation might go in. But I think right now we're at a really interesting crossroads with the sport of tackle football and its relationship to medicine and public health and thinking about how do we most ethically uh, protect kids and particularly their long-term health while also making sure they have access to healthy physical activity. Great, thank you. Thank you. Jonathan? Thank you. Um, one of the things we do is, aside from the work we do with the athletes in the community, but also our student athletes at the University of Louisville, 
is we actually have a fellowship program where we train future sports medicine physicians. So one of the things that we've been tax tasked with from day one is looking at the ethics and some of these pieces that surround sports medicine because for a few reasons it really is unique. So uh, when I was asked like, what do you wanna speak about? And I saw you had written books about concussion. I said, that's not something that necessarily keeps me up at night. The things that, the challenges that I find on a day-to-day -day basis are the things that take me out of my norms as a physician. So we're all used to the dynamic. You know, you make an appointment with your doctor, you go in, either you pay them or the insurance company pays them. You're seeing them alone and you get medicine, you take it or you don't, and you go on your way. But when we confound this with all the pieces that are involved in sports medicine, typically at higher levels, you know, college and up, there's a lot of dynamics there that really change it. So one of the things that I think about is how the doctor-patient relationship is really changed. It is not what you would see typically if you go see the doctor. So right off the bat, if I'm seeing a student athlete from my institution, they're not making an appointment with me, they're being brought in, they're not paying me, um, someone else is making that appointment, someone else is almost inevitably in the room, so we're dealing with privacy issues different than we have otherwise. I'm, probably, I'm getting payment, like in my institution, my group has a contract to help support our time with the athletic department. In other places, your time is supported in other ways. Um, physicians that work with professional teams have an individual contract. So if you work with, let's say, the Jets or something, you may be getting a certain amount of money just to do that from the Jets. But you're being asked to take care of the athlete. So who are you ultimately responsible to? You have kind of dual responsibilities. And at least what we try to instill and what we're taught in med school and what we teach in fellowship is that ultimately your responsibility is to the athlete, it is to the patient. That being said, someone's paying your check. It's fun being on sidelines. It's prestigious. I, get re I got really good seats at a Final Four and a Sugar Bowl. I mean, it's a nice gig. And if you, so you have to kind of keep those in mind. I try my best. I feel like I do the best for my student athletes. And I think my colleagues do too, but you can't take those things away. They're always in the back of your mind. So it brings up some other ideas like you mentioned informed consent. If I'm taking care of an athlete on a sideline, when are we really going through a consent process if I'm looking at them in a minute and making a decision, you can go in the back in the game or you can't. Or a couple months ago, I put stitches in an opposing team player during halftime. I couldn't tell you, he could walk in here, I wouldn't know who he was. I wouldn't even know. So they were more than happy. They thanked me 10 times. So I feel like that was consent in its way, but it's not the traditional norm. So it's definitely, it's definitely different than what we're taught in medical school. So other pieces that come with that is then, I think privacy is an issue because for the student athletes we take care of, there's always an athletic trainer involved. And immediately you think about, okay, you have doctor and patient, but once you're taking care of a high level athlete, you kind of have all those spokes around there. You have parents, coaches, conditioning staff, um, possibly an agent, and even other, I'm not thinking of right now. So there's so many competing demands for the outcome of a decision you make that again, it's, it, it changes that traditional uh, doctor-patient relationship in a lot of ways. You know, you see someone and by the time I even walk back to the sideline, I have fans, maybe an athletic director, someone else saying, oh, what was it, what was it? So you get all those questions. So there's, there's privacy issues that you don't necessarily, you're not taught how to handle them. It's different than the typical. So that's another part I think about. And then the, again, the monetization of it all in as much as for us, you know, they're helping cover our time so I can go there and help, help out the teams. In other places, especially at the professional level, you have big hospital systems paying for the right to take care of the athletes or maybe they're not even doing it, they're just putting their name on there and they have someone on the sideline. So there's a lot of confounders to how, compared to what we normally do uh, when we take care of patients. But in the end, what we try to do is, again, the patient first, you wanna do the best you can on their behalf, but again, you can't take away those other competing demands because if you 
really ignore them 100%, they're gonna probably find someone else. So that's the first thing I thought about, was kind of the, how the doctor-patient relationship has changed. The second one all relates to kind of the area, and it's not all about liability, but it's more health and safety versus performance and participation. So for instance, one of the things I'm asked to do all the time is the day they get on campus, I'm signing off on their participation. So you have a young athlete, 18 years old, they've been playing whatever, they've been playing volleyball probably since they were four years old. And then that day they're walking in, I'm supposed to say they're okay to keep doing what they were doing. They may already have a scholarship set up. And then it's up to me to say, yeah, this is fine. Well, what if I say, no, I think I found something wrong and then I don't think they can play. That doesn't always go well. Um, we had a case last summer where there was somebody who came up that had a heart condition. We knew about it. They told people. Um, she was playing in high school. We saw what it was, and we're like, no, she cannot play here. We will not sign off on it. Family said, well, we'll sign a waiver. We'll find a cardiologist to sign off on this. We're like, well, you can come up here. You can see one of our cardiologists, but we already talked to her, and she said she won't sign off on this either. So you have these competing things about, well, can a family say, well, we'll assume the risk, and a physician saying, well, no, I think it's an undue risk. So where does that line get drawn? You have people that maybe have an elevated risk of injury as opposed to somebody who you really feel can do harm to themselves. When these things don't get decided in, a, in an easy way, they usually err on the side of the physician saying, no, I don't think you can play. And they, you know, when it goes to court, and it does, they usually back it up. And they say, as long as you had a rational and reasonable reason for it, then they back you up. And that's been documented again and again and again. But that's one of the other things we worry about or deal with. But then the other becomes the ones are, well, I diagnosed you with, let's say, mono. That happened to a quarterback in town last fall. The quarterback may say, I don't care. I'll be fine. Let me play. I'll sign whatever you want me to sign. And then I'll say, no, no, we're not going to do this. You know, you have a risk of an internal organ damage that is 500-fold what it was when you don't have mono. So that's something we think about. And it's something you say, well, they want to play, let them play. It doesn't work that way. You're still held to the standard of the community that you would be for the non-professional, non-intercollegiate you know, student athlete. So those are the challenges we really struggle with, not every day, but those are the things that really kind of keep us up. And then the only other part I would say on that one is is it, most of that really just kind of comes down to do you have the right to play or do you have the right as a physician to say no I think you're going to do too much significant harm to yourself and then that's where you kind of leave things and you know if you again if you're rational and reasonable and in the end if you're kind of erring on the side of safety for your athlete you're probably on the right right side but those are the types of issues we deal with so anyway Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Barbara Rothschild. I teach uh, clinical ethics here at Columbia University. I have a lot of students in the audience, and I'm telling them right now I'm going to read some notes because they know from experience that I can go way off topic <laughs> if I'm not stay strictly on my topic. But along those lines, <laughs> um, I wanted to say for Dr. Shinsky, thank you so much. And I, I sent her book to um, a friend of mine already this morning as I was like looking through because I think there's so many questions out there, the uncertainty around children and these sports. And just to have um, a readable history with some of these statistics well laid out for parents to make an informed decision is just so important and something we've been lacking up until this point. So I think it's hugely important. Um, and I wanted to say to Dr. Becker, um, one of the things you made me think of was some of these 18-year-olds deciding, and I apologize to all the 18-year-olds in the room, but um, my students know that we talk about this age group from 16 to 24 that have a salient belief versus a factual belief. And we know from their brain structures that they tend to have beliefs that while they can tell you what the facts are, for example, I know that speeding causes crashes, but when they apply it to themselves, but I won't crash, right? So every, every parent has had to deal with a teenager in this way. Um, I know this fact is, is risky or this thing is it, but it's not going to happen to me. 
Um, and this is a classic situation in that age group and something you must have to deal with, <laughs> it sounds like, all the time. Not to interrupt, but I will yes, say, please. no, we usually FaceTime mom while we're doing it. So no, as soon as we're done, if it's anything more than the sniffles, we do. And yeah, no, they, they hear about it right away. Um, but sometimes they're worse. They're the moms. Or, yeah. No, dads are worse. Dads. Moms, moms always want them to help out. Dads are worse. So I think a lot of my comments will likely um, support much of what Dr. Becker has said, just in um, putting them in sort of more general sort of clinical ethics terms. Um, so like I said, I'm a physician. I've been teaching clinical medical ethics for nearly 20 years um, and here at Columbia for almost 10 years. Um, and my interest and expertise uh, in, is in the relationship between the medical caregiver and the patient, that traditional relationship that Dr. Becker referred to. Um, and my students and I look at the professional obligations and responsibilities of the caregiver, and we look at all the sort of cultural, social, race and gender, power factors that play a role in that relationship, but still within the traditional boundaries of, of, of expectation. And then there's financial, always financial, and it sounds like it's always financial in your world. Um, my bread and butter is really medical mistakes, end of life care, maternal fetal relationships, et cetera. Um, so I'd like to try to come to some of the issues in sports medicine, um, specifically from this medical ethics perspective and sort of enter in through, through our general way of thinking that way. So um, in discussing the fair distribution of resources, uh, Norman Daniels, who, who is a philosopher, political theorist, and has worked a lot in resource, resource allocation in, in medicine and health, um, he speaks about preserving opportunity, and I like, I like this phrase a lot, and I think it can be helpful. So he was referring to all the things it takes to pursue a life, like food, water, shelter, and he argues health care, which is why we talk about him. Um, it's an interesting way of seeing the world, and it's also very helpful when discussing the allocation of resources, how we should, how we should distribute things. So I'd like to steal this idea of preserving opportunity um, and apply it to clinical ethics and sports for a moment. So let's, let's propose that a physician's duty is to assist the patient or the athlete in preserving opportunity. Keep the patient as healthy as possible so that they may pursue all the things that make a life, a job, a hobby, family, relationships. But defining that opportunity for the athlete may be trickier. Let's keep that in mind. In order for the physician to accomplish such a goal, his, focus, his or her focus must be the interest of the patient. There can be no conflict of interest or confounding factors. And although I got to this a little roundabout, I think most people expect this from their doctor. Most people want their doctor to not have a conflict of interest, to have their personal best interest in mind. Outside of sport, we all want our physician to be making decisions on our account, not on account of the insurance company or our employer or anyone else. In fact, we have policies to protect us from disclosure to those entities against our will, things like HIPAA. But what about the college athlete? And in our world of medical ethics here in the US, autonomy is king. Your right to decide what happens to your body is yours alone. But what happens when an athlete experiences a concussion or even a wrenched ankle? And because they are a good athlete, they believe in the team. They believe in winning. They believe in pulling their weight. They wish to return to the field despite the judgment of a medical professional. That sort of salient and factual belief. They don't want to let down the team, the coach, their future. How far does their autonomy extend? On the flip side, what's the role of the team physician? Where do their obligations lie? With the team or with the player? What rights of confidentiality exist with the team doctor? Information obtained, obtained by a team employed physician in the care of a professional athlete may be considered part of the employment record and not subject to HIPAA and thus not confidential. A survey of team physicians in 2005 revealed that half of them admitted to choosing to disclose sensitive information such as drug use, infections, the use of performance enhancing drugs, et cetera, to team management. What's the problem with this arrangement? The athlete will reasonably choose to hide information from the very person they're supposed to be getting help from. Many people may not be aware that the medical care and training of college athletes is not standardized in the sense that different institutions structure the line of command differently, something Dr. Becker also referred to. Some colleges have the athletic trainers nested within a medical unit at the university, and some colleges have athletic trainers report directly to coaches. 
These differing structures may have a huge impact on their ability to function independently if that's in fact what we really want them to do. <coughs> A study from 2015 surveyed 789 trainers and 111 team physicians and asked them if they had ever felt pressure to return an athlete to play before they felt it was safe after concussion. 64% reported feeling pressure from athletes and 53% reported feeling pressure from coaches. And when the structure was such that the physician or trainer answered directly to the coaching, coaching staff, the pressure was much greater. Um, so I think I, I had this quote from that someone from the NFL, though we have you know, someone who actually works with athletes, but I like this quote because I think this explores some of the difficulty. Um, he said, I wasn't going to let a simple concussion slow me down. So I screwed with my own test results to protect my spot in the lineup and on special teams. Looking back, it was one of the worst decisions I ever made, especially after experiencing a concussion in 2003, the one that knocked me out, and playing the next week in Carolina, where I'm from. I took the test during the practice week and was right back on the field, but I would probably do it again if it kept me on the roster. Um, as someone who thinks about clinical ethics a lot, this quote makes me pause for many reasons. Capacity is the foundation of autonomy, i.e. the ability to make decisions underlies our right to make those decisions. How might a concussion interfere with capacity? How might the pressure of team play or a coach or financial considerations, and by extension family, interfere with capacity? We say capacity is the ability to make a reasoned decision. Was that reasoned? And on the heat, in the field, in the heat of battle, who gets to decide what capacity really is and with what underlying incentives? I just want to say, and this is to Dr. Pachinsky's last point about culture versus harm reduction, that it is reasonable to ask ourselves some honest questions about the purpose of competitive contact sport. I have parents asking me regularly if I think it is safe for their child to play X sport. I don't know. Frankly, uncertainty is a constant partner of medicine and one of the most challenging aspects of clinical medicine. Sometimes uncertainty exists because we simply cannot predict the future but sometimes it exists because we haven't done the work or the research it takes to know. It is always important to ask why we haven't done that work. Who doesn't want to know the answer and who didn't realize it was answerable? As far as contact sports go, there is much to know and study. And high school is one thing. The athletes aren't as big and as strong and as able. College, quite another. And given the cost of college education, which in turn equals the opportunity that we started talking about, right? That's what. That's what all these athletes are going for. This is a deal that is very tempting, whatever the physical risks. And I just, as a, as a culture, is this what we want? Great. Well, three very interesting and important perspectives uh, and uh, well-informed. So uh, I thought we would open up the floor for questions and please don't be shy. Oh, a oh, question, okay. yes, go ahead, sorry, I didn't see the lights. Kyle, go ahead. And people online, please feel free to type questions in. Yeah, this is a quick question for Dr. Becker. Um, in relation to the doctor-patient, or doctor-athlete in this case relationship, um, you work with the University of Louisville, which I know is a prestigious uh, university, puts out a lot of professional athletes basketball and football, is there, especially for draft eligible athletes, is there pressure on physicians such as yourself um, or maybe some of your colleagues to downplay the severity of injuries, especially towards draft season? I know it's such a, it's such a huge financial kind of incentive for these, for these kids, and so I was curious if you run, run into that at all. It's a, that's a good question. Um, what I've had to do for a number of our athletes that were very clearly going to get drafted they can take out insurance policies, and um, I've had to sign off on their physicals. And fortunately, we have good record keeping, so they'll ask for records. Like, and it's funny what they ask about. They'll ask about toes and shoulders, not so much other stuff, you know, because they want to know what they're getting into. And um, fortunately, I haven't had an issue where we really just write the facts out, we have good records, and we just send them. Now, are there other people maybe not doing it that way? Of course, I mean, I don't know. But I work with good people, and we have good records, and that's usually what we do. 
Now, the, the one new one that I think is a little, I think that's the last maybe five, 10 years, is the draft eligible college football player who gets a modest injury and says, you know what, I'm, I'm done. They sort of decide. Um, I'm sitting out the bowl game. I'm sitting out the last couple games. They're probably okay. They could probably play through it, but they're at the point, you know what, I'm good. I'm, I'm getting ready for, uh, actually it's combine week this week. I'm getting, ready, I'm getting ready for February. That's a part where they do have some autonomy and you can't, you can't make someone play. And that's usually not, that's not something that necessarily lies with the physician. That's more the relationship between the athlete and the coach. And you know, they, if anything, they may wanna lean the way of, well, I don't think I wanna go back in there. I'm good, I've done enough, I'm gonna get picked. So it kinda goes both ways. Other sports, no, they just wanna play. Um, but I'm fortunate, I work with good people, and I haven't had one that's kept me up at night with those, but um, I've had to sign off on those policies, and we, 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 they have records, you know, you, you can't fake the MRI result, you know, it's there. So, and they do look at it, so. Yes, Laura. Leave a mic just a second. I'm gonna ask a genetics-related question, because that's what I do. Um, so you've all spoken to the tension between, you know, okay, you have uh, the agenda of the athlete and the agenda of the school, uh, but the uh, agenda of the athlete may not be what you think is in their best interest. So it's not a simple autonomy question, right? Not just like, well, it's just, we'll let the athlete do whatever they want because they may, they may be under a, a lot of different pressures and maybe not in a position to judge their own interests in some ways. This gets very complicated. So if you could sort, and there's some evidence that maybe you can, uh, people, obviously schools, leagues, so on, have a great deal of interest in limiting their liability in terms of concussion risk, right? So if you could sort people into lower and higher risk, according to genetics, and there's some evidence that you can in terms of response to concussion, um, would schools or leagues do you think have the right to use that to limit their liability by excluding people who are at higher genetic risk? It wouldn't be definitive, it would simply be higher risk, lower risk. And should that simply always simply go to the individual and they be able to say, I don't care how much risk I'm at, I can do it. Um, they, there's some evidence that genetic differences would be the difference between the person who recovers well from the concussion and the person who has a lot of damage. So if you could sort the population that way, I'm asking you guys, do you think schools and leagues should be allowed to use that information? People should be allowed to sign waivers saying, I understand my risk, I don't care, what do you think? Just easy question. Very simple question. Um, I guess I would start by saying, I do think this is really hypothetical right now because the brain is incredibly complicated and even though we know information about particular genes, we really do not understand right now why in some cases it might take months to recover from a concussion whereas another person might recover in a couple weeks. So I don't think we really currently can translate genetic information to really know sort of on an individual level what concussion recovery could look like. I actually think the way I think about this question is especially when it comes to kids, and there might be a different answer for adults, but when it comes to kids, I would like schools to promote policies that protect the most vulnerable kids. So I would like to see schools, if we learned, for example, that there was some category of children that were even more likely to suffer long-term consequences of concussions, I think the obligation would be for schools to offer sports activities with lower risk of concussion. I guess the way I would think of it would be the, the obligation should be to try to protect the more vulnerable rather than to try to extend um, higher risk options to children with a particular gene, if that makes sense. So I actually might frame it almost the opposite way um, and say I, I would see the obligation to be we really shouldn't be offering a sport where you know a quarter of our students couldn't participate because they have XYZ gene or something of that nature. Again, I think we're speaking in very hypothetical terms right now because we can't really translate the genetic information we have to know who falls into what category or how we would categorize children, but I guess that's how I would 
begin to think about that. But, but I think that it, it might be helpful to think of sport as not a carve out. And we have GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Disclosure Act, for a reason, for non-discrimination. And so, you know, that we might be thinking, oh, well, this genetic test will help us, you know, strat stratify in a way that protects people. But actually, ultimately, and all of this genetic information can end in discrimination. And so I think, I don't think schools would ever have a right to those results. And you would, you know, you would hope that individuals who get tested would then also have counseling. And I'm not just saying that because <laughs> you're a genetic counselor, but that they would and, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the fact that the schools are getting the results or that, that the fact that school that that the school would have those results, I find troubling and worries me just generally that people don't understand the implications of their own genetic results. And we're seeing that much more with like 23andMe, you know, and finding half brothers and sisters all over the place that you didn't know you had because people are people, um, <laughs> and behavior is behavior. I mean, but I think that, um, so, so I, I it, but, but like the salient belief, we all say, oh, it's not such a big deal, I'm gonna put my stuff out there, but actually there's huge implications for these genetic tests and huge implications for allowing your employer or your college, which is essentially your employer if you're the athlete, access to those results, and I would find that very worrisome. I would just add that my understanding is Gina would, uh, does not cover this situation. So in other words, technically a school could say we want to look at your genes and decide who should be on the team or not, and et cetera. Do you wonder if California, if California pays athletes, whether that, as an idea, will right. change? Right. So the story for those who don't know, so Gina covers health insurance and employers, uh, but does not cover other situations, life insurance, disability insurance, school. Right. 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 Let me take what you. So I think what you asked kind of has two parts to it. One, you asked about genetic testing for concussions. We're not there yet. So I think you're asking about something that's very hypothetical, but, and this is completely, completely opinion. I think that our answer is somewhere in there one of these days. I think that's gonna bear out that there are certain people at higher risk than others, um, separate than the kid issue, which is a different one. But I would say, if you're wanting to play sport at a high level, professional or college, you are already submitting the testing. So it may not be genetic testing, which we don't, you know, it's still early, we don't, so it's kind of out there and a little scary. But if, if you all came into my school and I said, okay, we're doing your physical and you gotta go get your heart testing, nobody bats an eye. If you had a child or a sibling that came to a university and said, okay, you're here, we're gonna do uh, an EKG, and an echocardiogram, and for the, that's like an ultrasound of your heart. Nobody would, would you, nobody would question that. Oh, okay, good, I'm glad they're checking that. Well then what if I find something? And that happens, and it happens one in a number of hundred, one in every 500. We find something like, uh-oh, we got a problem. And they're there on campus that day. Their conditioning coach is there like, come on, let's go. Like you need to be in the weight room in two hours. Or like hold the phone. Like this may not happen. So I think what you, if you're asking a question about testing, they submit to testing every day um, at every level. So is that discrimination where if I find a heart problem that says if you exert, your chances of sudden death are 700 fold and I tell you you can't play? Um, you, know, you see what I'm saying? Is that discrimination? But also who has yeah. access to that information? And we, when we do that, yeah. We've had, one, we've had ones where we found like a, an odd finding and then we go get the confirmatory genetic testing because honestly, we're getting someone there that wants to participate and we're kind of the bad guy. Like we're saying, uh-uh, you can't. 
So they want to share that testing, but then again, it's my, I'm the one liable. My name is the one signing it. So I have to do what's right in my conscience, and if I find out that they have something that puts them at a huge risk for sudden death or other calamity, then I'm gonna be the one that says, no, you're not gonna play. So when they're coming in, for, so if they saw me in the office, then I have the traditional doctor-patient relationship and their records are private, right? I do what they want. So, and this would be the case of if somebody showed up at our university getting cleared to play and they're like, oh, no, 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 I saw a cardiologist at home two years ago and they did all the testing and they cleared me. I said, oh, please send us those records. Let's not redo this again. Then it's up to them. They don't have to. But they are coming in, they're signing a waiver, or if they're not 18, their parents are signing it, and they are submitting to a physical to be cleared, with, which includes labs and cardiac testing. So, um, so yeah, so they are, they are saying, yes, I, you, you can do these tests on me. So and if somebody said, no, you can, I mean, what if they came in and they said, no, you cannot listen to my heart? Then we're like, well, what's going on? Um, we, we had one, I remember this, this is, this is a good one. He was a, I can't remember, he was like a walk-on, walk-on on the football team, and he was lifting weights one day, passes out, just out. And then we come in, blood pressure sky high, and, we're, we're going, and then we're like, what's going on? And he, he was fine, and we're like, we gotta get some heart testing, that was our first worry. And somebody pulled his folder out, there's nothing in it except his physical, and he said, no family history, no nothing. And, and then we asked him again, any problems ever run in the family? He goes, well, he goes, yeah, my brother had this thing once. He was playing basketball and he passed out. And then they brought him to the doctor and they had to put one of those little things in that shocks his heart to start. And, you know, so now he's okay. I said, well, why didn't you tell us that? And he goes, well, then you wouldn't let me play. And I'm like, all right. I mean, so well done. I mean, he was right. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, but they do submit to testing. I mean, so I know like genetic testing is not, it's not there yet for routine use but they do submit to testing the day they set foot on campus. There's a question, uh, yes, Sven. Do, I think we need the mic, just wait one second. This is for uh, Dr. Becker and Dr. Uh, Rothschild. You guys both talked about the differences between uh, the setup and structure in athletic departments and athletic medicine, whether they're separate or they're combined as one, whether you're answering to the coach and it's all part of athletic department or it's a separate hospital that has control of the athletic medicine. It seems obvious that the combined athletics, uh, athletic department controlling the medicine department like of this entire thing would be, have an ethical concern about coaches breathing down your neck, having to make decisions to, in the best of the, the play, or the, the team, et cetera, and the program. Do you find that having a separate uh, medical department or, or university uh, health office running the athletic medicine, does that reduce that kind of pressure or that ethical concern, or does those pressures from the coaches, the strength coach, et cetera, still play a role regardless of what the structure is? I mean, I think Dr. Becker can probably speak from personal experience. I will tell you that I, I find it, I, I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I was laughing, I was telling some people in the front here that like, I went to the, to the school with the biggest sports ethics scandal of like the century. So maybe that's where I learned what I know. But um, it is worrisome to me as seriously as UNC Chapel Hill takes sports that even a physician who doesn't necessarily answer to the coach or wasn't hired by the coach, even if it's a separate thing, there's still, the school is so invested in the sports program and, and mo more specifically in winning that it would, it still concerns me that the decision making, um, you're never really getting the kind of third party decision making that perhaps that athlete needs. Um, so I, I'll, I'll say, that, but I think Dr. Becker could probably speak to it more personally. I would say as many schools that are out there and professional teams, that's how many structures are out there. So there's, there's so many different ones. You, so even though I'm a University of Louisville faculty physician and employed by them, the medical support comes from like a private health group, 
We have a separate contract with athletics to help just fund our time. They don't put money in our pocket. It just helps you know, fund our time so me and my colleagues can cancel clinic to go be with the teams. So other schools have other ways. There, there's so many ways to do it. I will say this, no matter how you do it, no matter what you do, if you are an athletic trainer or a physician on a sideline, you serve at the pleasure of the coach, period. They don't want you there, you will not be there, you will be replaced, period. So we have a question from uh, someone online, actually. John? Yes. And people online, please feel free to ask questions. <laughs> so the question from David is, the American Psychological Association has determined that psychologists should not participate in and legitimize interrogations that involve torture. And various medical associations have determined that doctors should not administer capital punishment because it does not conform with the standard of care. In both cases, the withdrawal of all physician participation has reduced these practices. Should physicians follow these examples and wholly withdraw from participation in college football? Yeah, spicy question. <laughs> well, I can say I actually have heard that debate much more in boxing. I'm not sure if people are familiar with this at all, but there's been a really interesting debate. I think a lot of this really got rolling in the 1980s. There are a couple really dramatic uh, deaths and, and severe injuries that led the American Medical Association to say, and, and also the neurologists to say, you know, boxing is just fundamentally contrary to our mission, especially the neurologists. The, point of the sport is to damage the brain, we as neurologists can't support this. And we as the American Medical Association, we, we have to recommend against this. And that led to some really interesting conversations about by being present at the ringside as a physician, are you in some sense kind of lending your support and credibility to boxing in a way that's in tension, in, in tension with your very mission to protect the human brain? Um, and so that, I think, is very much an ongoing debate. And I think this question maybe is suggesting, do, does this debate need to extend to college football? Um, I think that raises, I guess, the, the two perspectives I mentioned earlier, which is sort of the idea of harm reduction versus shifting the culture. I think the argument for physicians being at the ringside or on the field side is, well, maybe you can reduce the harm in some sense by being present. You could remove the player if they have a concussion to at least prevent a second concussion in quick succession. You could have your role there be, in some sense, protective. And I think the argument uh, against physicians being present at the ringside or, or um, at the side of a college football game might be, are you sort of endorsing that this is somehow appropriate or safe in a way that's in conflict with your professional mission? As a non-physician, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer it, but at least that's how I would lay out the ethical considerations on both sides of that question. You answered it really well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? I, no, I think, to, just to comp I think comparing yeah. intercollegiate football to capital punishment is a, taking a few steps. <laughs> but I feel like if my presence or that of my colleagues can miti mitigate um, what's otherwise a very violent sport and mitigate whatever harm they're doing, I feel like our presence is justified. Uh, so this person here, yes. You had mentioned earlier um, kind of changing the youth culture uh, to get away from taco football to a less violent, like a flag football. I'm curious if that creates a situation where the generation eventually gets older and the top talent look to play professional football and at some point they're adults and they start playing tackle football for the first time, whether it be at a collegiate level or an NFL level, where you have a group of people who were never taught proper techniques of how to tackle and they don't know how to tackle and they were never taught what to do when they get hit and they don't know how to minimize impact and they don't know what to do, there's no experience there. So now you have the best athletes, the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, playing a very violent game for the, for the first time with no experience, if in any way that actually makes the health concerns greater because they, they just don't know how to react to it. Yeah, that's definitely a, a concern I've heard. Um, I think 
The best evidence we have for this actually comes from ice hockey, because that argument has also been made with regard to body checking. I don't know how many people are familiar with ice hockey, but body checking is sort of the riskiest me mechanism in ice hockey, just as you could say tackling is the riskiest mechanism in football. And so recently, um, a couple years ago, the um, I think it's the Canadian Pediatric Society, the Canadian equivalent of the American Academy of Pediatrics, actually recommended we should increase the age a little bit and not have the 11 and 12 year olds body check each other and, and wait a little bit longer. And that led to a very similar debate with a very similar argument. So what ended up happening, there was this sort of interim period where there were some leagues that allowed the younger kids to body check and other leagues that did not. And they basically did a comparison and the evidence seems to be you really don't need to learn how to body check at age 10 or 11. Similarly, I don't think you need to learn how to tackle at age five or six. Um, and in fact, there are many uh, current NFL players who did not start playing football until they were at the high school level. Um, I certainly think if you do start to tackle at an older age, it is absolutely important um, that you are at, at minimum being instructed um, by coaches and, and sort of being overseen, but um, I think all the evidence we have suggests the benefit of not being exposed to re repeated collisions at age five or six sort of far outweighs the potential um, for needing a little bit more of uh, a learning curve once you start playing the sport at a later age. Um, so I think that that is the best evidence we have. On the other hand, I will say we don't have quite the same kind of data in tackle football that we do with body checking for the reason that we have not prohibited tackle football at a young age the way we have with body checking. So we aren't actually able to do the same kind of study we've done with body checking because we don't have that same kind of comparison available yet. But Dan, you had a question. Yeah. So my question is, uh, you know, you were talking about people in the room and with privacy and I know recently, like I used to wrestle, and I used to act, one of my friends was like a top wrestler in the country at one point in I, college. I, I only I stopped after high school, but you know the doctor came out with now I came out with that and has like then with the Olympic athlete doc like has this impacted because you know how do you has this impacted your practice at all? Is this like does this come up? How does it work with these you know these inc these major incidents that have come up? What do you mean? Oh, with the, like the molesting and the oh. I mean, it's abhorrent. I, I don't. Right. I mean, I don't even know what. I, but, st I, I still can't fathom. I mean, I've hung around. These are large gentlemen. I mean, what are they doing? I don't. I, don't, I mean, I'm pretty sure I get my butt whooped. I mean, do, I don't know what to do, say. Do they? <laughs> I, but, I, but I that, can't, it's 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 such a deviant thing. I, I I don't even know how to comment or answer. Well, no, no, no but, but yeah. that's really. I'm sorry. Then let me let me clarify my question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could tell you that goes back to Milgram with the authority figure, but in terms of what, why they. You know, do that. I mean, that, I'm, oh, by the way, I'm just sure telling you, I'm a, I'm a school counselor. So that's and but but in terms of, like, has it impacted your practice? Do they are they now doing? You're now getting chaperones. Are you now getting? Are they now having like you know discussions about this? Are they have trainings for it? Are there? You know, we haven't again because I, it's such a. I, I I don't know. It's like I, I don't know. Maybe we need to. I don't know. It just seems like something that's so far off. We haven't even fathomed that someone in our program would behave like that. I couldn't consider walking a room with a female athlete if there was going to be, you know, any clothes removed. I couldn't imagine walking in without a chaperone. I, I just right. so I don't, I don't know what to say. No, no, that's a yeah. that's the question. I was just asking if it yeah, impacted I, or if there's any. No, it hasn't. Maybe yeah, it hasn't changed our day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Got you. Uh, good. That's a good question, though. I, yeah. This gentleman here. And then we'll go to Kim afterward. I have a question for Dr. Hopefully I don't butcher the pronunciation. Uh, Bachinsky, is that right? Cool. Um, so you've alluded to numerous times harm reduction versus a culture shift in youth football. And as somebody who played growing up since I was six years old, um, once the knowledge of brain injuries and CTE has become a household name, more or less. The NFL has admitted a long-term link to uh, football and long-term brain injury. Has that knowledge, and it might be a little too recent to actually see a change, has that knowledge 
kind of change the culture away from these um, full contact sports in youth. And I guess as a follow up to that, is that, I don't think fear is the right word, but knowledge, is that enough to incite the type of culture change that needs to be seen? Or is it more of a twofold also offering the alternatives at the youth level? Those are such good questions. Um, I think there's been the beginnings of a cultural shift, but not nearly as much as one might think. And there, what I mean by that is there's certainly a, a small dip, like a couple of percentage points in football participation. And I also think there's been a very important culture shift and at least recognizing that a brain injury is an injury. I do think we've at least seen real change from previously describing a brain injury as, oh, you just are seeing stars, or you just got your bell rung, you can just block it off. I do think there's been a shift in language to say, that's actually a brain injury, you should get checked out. I think that's been a shift. But in terms of actually shifting to safer alternatives for younger children, I think we have a long way to go. And I think there's a lot of big structural reasons for that. So just as one example, the fact that college scholarships are still very much tied to football, I think means many families very understandably, if they don't see other options to be able to afford for their child to go to college, are going to say, the trade-off is worth it. We've heard about CT in the news. We're going to try to protect our child as much as possible, but we think it's worth it for um, the potential to get a college scholarship to, to potentially take on this risk. So I actually think that some of the ethical questions even have to be kicked up even a higher level to a structural level of should college scholarships sort of be offered as a carrot? What are sort of the, the rewards and incentives? And how is that sh sh shaping or shifting the culture at the youth level? Because I do think a lot of what's going on at the youth level is very much shaped by what's going on at college and professional levels. So if there aren't fundamental changes happening at the higher levels, that will definitely constrain the changes that happen at the younger ages. And, and to add to that, I think we were talking earlier about the influence. I mean, the NFL is extremely big business, and what feeds the NFL are fans. And so if fans don't change their habits, if fans don't stop watching and supporting, it's unlikely to change, period. There's just too much money involved. Um, and playing as a child, um, almost, I think, 60% of like the diehard fans of the NFL played as a, as a child. So it's an investment, you know, for that's where their fan base is coming from. And I think this all is a, that cultural change is, at, even though we're, I think, most concerned about the youth, it's actually at all levels that it would have to happen. Uh, Kim. And we'll come back to this slide. Thanks. So um, I'm a neurologist by training, and I'm also probably not qualified to say anything about sports as the last person who was picked for every team throughout my whole life. <laughs> that being said, um, what I found interesting was that um, I was surprised with Dr. Becker saying that you actually are working to make sure that they don't go back in because I was sort of leaning toward what Dr. Rothschild was saying because I see almost like a military theme that's going on a little bit because she, she said the word that you're back on the battlefield, it's to win, where the ethics of things kind of change because when you join the military, you give up your autonomy knowing that your whole goal is to win. So um, it's sort of less of a question than maybe a statement, but it just seems that like because of the big business aspects and because of the issues involved, and um, the financial gains and the scholarships and the things and people, the knowledge that they have, but, you know, and I'm not advocating this, but perhaps there is, you know, a sense that like you, from your autonomous choice as a player, you could reasonably make that judgment, maybe not as a child, of course, but as a professional person to say, well, I'm gonna give up or know my risks because this is financially very rewarding to me and I love the game or whatever, just like you do construction work and there's hazard pay or things like that. And again, I'm not really advocating for that, but it just like kind of struck me the, um, the sort of parallels to sometimes like military, which does have a slightly different ethical code, unfortunately. I, don't, I think people have a, a view of this that maybe isn't what it is in practicality and over the last, one of the things I've seen over many of the last, what, 17, 18 years I've been doing this, is that as the publicity of concussion has gone up, mm -hmm. 
and the knowledge of it, the coaches actually, they look, I mean, they, it, it's there, it's tiny, but they have this ability to self-reflect a little bit. It's not much, but, but um, they, they get it now. So whereas I remember maybe my first year out of training, I had a high school coach yell at me that this kid, oh, you can go back in. I went to a seminar. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, whereas now, I don't get a whole lot of, if we, if we hold someone out for a concussion, we don't get much pushback. We really don't. Um, we may get questions. What's going on? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? You know, I talked to someone in another school, they're doing this test. You know, you may get, you know, they may needle the athletic trainer a little bit about how they're handling it. But if you take, like, during a game, you say they're out, they're, they really don't question it anymore. It's really, the, the publicity has really helped that and it's gone the right, that, there, there are pieces that have gone the right way here. And, um, and I think just like you were saying, it's, change is slow, but there, there are like NCAAs cut back on practice hours, um, number of contact days they can do in um, preseason, um, number of contact days they can do during a game week. I mean, they, they pull back a little, again, these changes aren't, aren't global shifts, but they, they're starting to, realize that the number of impact and number of collisions does have um, some outcome here. So it, it's not quite, it's, it's not quite the, what, the capital punishment or the military type thing. I mean, it's a little bit of it. It's not pretty, but um, we don't get as much pushback, especially on concussions. Like, if they see it and it seems legit, they, they understand. But I, I, will, I will say, I think you are spot on, at least speaking from the perspective of football, I'm not sure as much how, to what extent this is true of other sports, but certainly the history of football, it was promoted in many ways as an alternative to military training or a way to prepare people for the military. I mean, there really is a, a long history of that association. Um, and even though, um, as Dr. Becker pointed out, there's obviously some really positive shifts, I actually have seen, and I really hope this trend is not going any further, but there has been a trend, unfortunately, of some, hopefully a small minority of, of high school and college coaches trying to emulate military drills in their preseason training. And there's actually a, a horrible case, I believe, out in Long Island. I don't know if anyone here happened to hear of this story, where a high school, and this was, I believe, in August preseason, um, was having the high schoolers carry a 400-pound log, which is a Navy SEAL exercise. The high school children dropped the log, and one of the high school players died. And this drill is just completely inappropriate for high school children. So you do have, I think, hopefully again a minority, but you do have a small number at least of coaches who are trying to emulate military style training and have this idea that this can like toughen up or build up kids. And we sort of especially seem to be seeing this in the preseason workouts. It's not scientifically justified in any way. There's no log carrying that happens in the actual football game. There's no relevance to the sport. It just seems to be this, as you're pointing out, sort of like milita military, idea of we've got to sort of toughen this up. So I, I think there is some of that in the culture and it's definitely very concerning, especially if it's getting extended into the youth level of the game. So I think that's absolutely a cultural issue to be addressing that does increase the risks, in some cases, really extraordinary risks. Scott. So I have a question for Dr. Matinsky and a question for Dr. Becker. Start with Dr. Becker first. One, if you're not getting pushback on concussions, what are you getting pushback on now? You know, even though you don't get pushback, I will say concussions, and just to follow that up, because it's so, still so much of the diagnosis and recovery that we, do, that we monitor, all of it is subjective. Even our objective tests are somewhat subjective based on baseline tests that we started finding out that players were tanking or not paying attention to because they didn't want to have problems with it later. So, and that happens but, in the Ivy League too, by the way. That's no, no, not just a, yeah. yeah. No, so that's the part that's tricky. Um, I would say something like the ankle sprain. Why aren't they back? Why aren't they ready? You know, why aren't they? You know, they should be available. Those are the type. You know, not the ones. If the, you know, um, concussion at least day one, it's good. Day fourteen, they're like, what's going on? Um, surgical scars, they get. You know, once you cut on them, they go, they're gone. It's all that gray area in between that they kind of be like, okay, they need to be ready. Why aren't they ready? What's going on? Uh, and Dr. Baczynski, the NFL 
uh, owners and the executive committee of the Players Association um, have agreed in the last uh, 48 hours to extend uh, the collective bargaining agreement. The players as a group still have to vote on it. It would add a 17th game to the regular season, eliminate, uh, if they agree to this, eliminate uh, one of the preseason games and greatly reduce the amount of off-season uh, or preseason hitting uh, in practices from like 28 padded practices down to 16. Uh, in exchange for a dramatic increase in base salary for the rank and file players somewhere in the neighborhood right now if they make a minimum in the 500,000 range over the course of the 10 year agreement that would be increased to a million dollars a year okay for rookie players coming into the league so hazard pay um, certainly is the working definition um, there but I'm curious as to you as from someone who's looked at that from a public health perspective uh, what your thoughts are uh, on the matter that's a really interesting question. I, I hadn't followed the last sort of the latest developments, but um, I would I would at least say from a public health point of view. So I've mostly focused on kids, which is a different set of ethical questions. But when it comes to the NFL, you would think of the NFL as a workplace. And what I think would be really interesting, which hasn't happened to my knowledge at all, would be if OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety Health Administration, our sort of federal agency that oversees health in the workplace, were to get involved and to actually evaluate the level of risk and sort of do epidemiological studies and sort of do a comparison kind of layout to what extent is this increasing the risk versus decreasing other kinds of risks, to what extent are the employees informed of these risks, and are there any risks here that are just not appropriate for a workplace at all? I mean, there are definitely certain risks we say we just should not be exposed to that risk in the workplace. And I think it would be really interesting to think about, and I think other, several other scholars, in fact, I believe a former um, OSHA official named Adam Finkel has written on this very question of what would it look like for OSHA to actually get involved and regulate, because I don't think there's sort of an independent health body that's sort of there to give that kind of scientific guidance, that, that advice on what do these changes truly mean for players' health from an occupational point of view, and should there be a sort of independent body advising on that? So. And just a, from an, you mentioned hazard pay as a concept, which is has some tricky ethics to it, right? Because what's hazard pay, and then what's coercive pay? What is so much money that you'll be willing to take on a risk that you wouldn't otherwise be willing to take on, and what does that actually? And, and who among us is willing to do that? Is that limited to a certain segment of society, or was that everybody would say, oh, for a million dollars, I'd definitely increase my risk of, say, early Alzheimer's by 10%. Um, so that's a, it's a, it's a, that's a tricky ethical calculus to do and to know what that really means to people. Right, but these are adults who are presumably exercising their own yes. So absolutely, and so for the individual, it falls within what we what we say is acceptable. But just as a culture or as a society, it's probably worth reflecting what that says about us. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, I hope our speakers may be uh, willing to stay a little while. And people who are here, please feel free to come up and ask them questions. Uh, and please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to staying in touch with you, so thank you.